We uh, have a panel um, now um, in, in which we're going to be talking about digital health innovation and initiatives, again, in a, through a lens of healthy aging. Um, but we're going to take a particular look at now uh, going around the world, Africa, uh, India, and even the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so what I'd like to do, just so you know who you've got uh, in front of you, is get uh, everybody to introduce themselves. We have two people sitting in front of you. You can see at the front of the room and two people online. Uh, I'm going to start with the people online and I'm going to start with the person who's up latest, uh, George Margellis. Would you please like to uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us uh, what you do in the aging space, if you can, just briefly. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this forum. Um, I have to say, I mean, you have kept me up till 4.30 yesterday morning watching it, so, and it's now 1.15 here, a.m. here, so I'm, you know, it's definitely a good morning from my perspective. Uh, my name is George Margellis. I'm a medical practitioner trained here in Australia, been involved in healthcare for some 40 years. I, I know that because we recently had our 40-year reunion of our med school. Um, and, and my focus from the bulk of that career has been in, in the use of technology. So currently I chair the Aged Care Industry Information Technology Council, which is the peak body representing the aged care providing sector in the use of innovation and technology in, in, in Australia. But over the years, I've been involved in the Health Informatics Society of Australia as a board member and as a, an advisor and what we call the CXIO ambassador, where we worked on, on developing clinical skills, clinical digital skills. Um, and you know, 10 years as, at Intel as part, part of their healthcare team, which is where I've got to meet quite a few of the uh, people here, here today. And the focus of my career really has been leveraging technology to improve the delivery of care. And as I've gotten older, I've recognized that the population that we predominantly provide healthcare services to is the older population. And how do we make that experience better? So I think that's the focus of our group now is looking at how we make the experience better, not just for the uh, people receiving care, but for those delivering care as well. And I think that's a really critical component going forward. So looking forward to Great. this discussion. Great. Thanks, George. Uh, Rajendra, uh, Rajendra uh, is in New Delhi. Uh, please, if I can uh, welcome and uh, if I can get you to introduce yourself, that would be great. Thanks, John. Thanks, George. Uh, so my name is Rajendra Pratap Gupta and I'm based in Delhi. I've been in healthcare for not 40 years, but close to 30 years. Uh, uh, senior in health, I would say, not yet senior citizen though. And uh, in my past avatar, I was advisor to the Health Minister of India from 2016 to 18. I drafted the national health policy and uh, my work has been around healthcare policy. Uh, I have worked across geographies. I've sat on boards in the US. I still sit on a large board in Europe and India. Uh, I am a champion of healthcare transformation and I believe technology is the tool to do that. That's the first one. I have been an author, not an authority, I must say, an author of a book, Digital Health Truly Transformation, which is a course book in Europe and other parts of the world. And in this sphere, I have been involved in the, the policy making, that's one. And the reason why I have been involved is that our country has a huge senior citizen population, which is, I guess, is close to 140 million as we speak. And I've been involved with the Indian Council of Medical Research for the assisted medical devices. The report we released on the 12th of this month and uh, other initiatives. Uh, we are drafting the home care and care homes guidelines that I am leading at Health Parliament, the think tank that I run besides the Digital Health Academy. Uh, so in all, one is on the health side. The other side is on the employment of seniors, you know, that or older adults as you would call them in the US. You know, uh, we're working on at the IGF and UN to create uh, what you call an opportunity to find uh, trainings and jobs for so-called older adults, which I think uh, quite a large segment of which is still willing to be employed to keep busy and to keep fit. So that's my work all around. Very good. Thank you, Raj. Uh, much appreciated. Well, and in the room, I have Andrew uh, Barnhill with me. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much, John. And thanks to the ECH Alliance for planning what has been really an exceptional 
couple of days here in New York. Um, so as John mentioned, I'm Andrew Barnhill. I'm the head of public policy and government affairs for IQVIA, um, which is the world's largest clinical research organization. Uh, I am based in Washington, DC, um, but I get up to New York pretty frequently because I also serve on the public policy faculty uh, here at NYU right down the street. Um, to give you a little bit of background on IQVIA and sort of my place in this conversation, you can think of our, our business, which is a complex health services business that has about 85,000 employees around the world. Um, but you can think of us through two frames. One, we conduct clinical trials for manufacturers of drugs and devices all around the world. Um, and then two, we have a large full-scale healthcare data business where we provide public health surveillance and other forms of data and analytics to um, the for-profit for sector, but also to governments around the world. So we um, will go in and, and help countries and help um, localities make sense of what the public health trends are looking like on the ground, and we can help them solve uh, particular problems. Um, one way to think about some of our you know, recent activity, for instance, during COVID-19, one side of our business, we conducted the full-scale clinical trials for two of the four approved COVID vaccinations. And the other side of our business, we provided um, some public health surveillance for about 36 different countries around the world. So that gives you a sense of IQVIA's scope. Um, we have a large and growing presence in Africa, which I'm going to speak to some today. And in fact, we have an Africa summit coming up um, where we focus specifically on some of our digital health uh, advances. So thanks for having me. Uh, of course, and uh, Andrew, thanks for that. And I think you can see the diversity and breadth we have, I mean, internationally in terms of uh, the three people on this panel. So um, I'm going to stay with you, Andrew, just in terms of the first question. It's for all of you, and I will come to you all progressively. But Andrew, can you just describe the practical approaches um, that are being made um, you know, to bring about healthy aging in the short, medium and long term, but with particular emphasis in your response in terms of you know, the region you're going to concentrate on, so Andrew, in your case, as far as Africa is uh, being concerned, and, and particularly as it relates to the risks in those populations that you're considering? Sure. No, thanks for the question, John. So one thing I'll start with as we frame a conversation around Africa is if you look back to the life expectancy at birth from 1990 was about the age of 51 life expectancy then. Today in 2023 on the African continent, that life expectancy is somewhere between 63 and 65. So we are seeing a, an aging population and also a growing population significantly over the past 30 years. One of the areas that we can focus our attention on is from my perspective as a government affairs person, the investment in long-term care programs in countries throughout Africa. Realistically today, only in a small range of about three or four middle and growing income countries in Africa do we see government-focused programs on long-term care that are holistic and receive government resources. Having said that, um, what we do see is a number of tactics taking place in a variety of countries, um, some of which I can highlight from, from Kenya and South Africa and Tanzania that have been working well and growing throughout the past decade. Um, one of which is integration with existing healthcare providers and healthcare systems. So working with primary care physicians to develop plans for the aging um, that may not require extra government resources, but may require a recalibration of time and investment of those providers. Um, another is family involvement, helping train family members who are likely going to be caregivers um, to many of the aging um, to, to find metrics for evaluating their care, um, both in the short term and long term. Some of that requires government investment. Some of it requires education by non-governmental organizations, but the family involvement has been an area of key focus that we've seen. Um, another has been on a, a focus of patient-centered care. Um, so what can we do to empower individuals to think about their long-term care patterns and the types of steps they are going to need to make to plan 10 and 20 years ahead. Um, so we've seen some great programs coming out of Kenya with that um, today. And then of course, um, investment particularly in training and upskilling of individuals who plan, much like we've talked about today, to work much longer than they might have anticipated. So how can we 
encourage a climate that helps people to find jobs as they are aging and helps train them um, for jumping into those roles in the future. So those are some of the things that we're seeing. We're also seeing some significant advances on the digital health side, which as we move forward, we can talk about some of those. Absolutely, that's great, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Raj, let's go to you next. Same question, if you can talk about these same issues or same question as it relates to uh, the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, so as a country, and if I look at numbers, uh, I think we beat every country in terms of the sheer staggering numbers we have. So if you look at the global population of senior citizens is 770 million by the last available estimates. In my country, we have 140 million which is 20% of the world's senior citizens, if I have to see roughly, I mean, you know, my biggest worry has been, you know, working on various policies, not today, but 25 years from now, when we complete 100 years of independence by 2045, 47, we would be 340 million senior citizens. That means every fifth person will be a senior citizen. So you, you, I mean, I think when you look at health, you only talk about the expenditure and income. I look from a very different angle now this is very important for india to address this huge uh, need gap we have this narrow window of opportunity to become a developed country if we do not address the uh, health of the so-called segment that we call a senior or would become senior by then we would have a severe economic crisis because we won't get another opportunity to become a developed country uh, we are already a lower middle income country and if i look at the average longevity we have gone up to 70.19 years so on one side your aging longevity is going up the percentage of population dependency ratio is actually tilting on the wrong side so we need to keep these people healthy so government has over the period of years come out with a national program for healthcare of elderly we recently launched uh, you know the as i said the assisted living devices uh, project which was rolled out on 12th of september we also have this called tide you know, which is the technology intervention for disabled and the elderly. So we have various calls going on. But uh, if you ask me honestly, this is not enough. I don't think that, you know, we have looked at the economic empowerment because my research in this field shows me that as you hit the 50s and the late 50s, your health issues come and catching up with you. Your income goes down and your expenditure goes up. So I think there has to be a special security scheme for the elderly and plus I think we need secondary prevention programs because primary prevention are too late for that age. We need secondary prevention. So I think uh, on the side I'm worried for what is the future of this segment which I think I will be also on the other side very shortly and uh, it is more not about health but India's economy and India's growth as we aspire to be a developed nation. So we're working on it. I would say it's a work in progress. There are multiple schemes of the government which are going on. Is it enough? Probably not. Are we doing our best? We're trying to. Uh, so let's see and hope, but it is more about the individual psyche. As I see health, we always take health as a medical issue, but I think the public health part and the behavioral part is more important. And we need to focus on that. And that is where I think uh, this discussion uh, could also touch upon that how do we nudge those people to adopt to healthier habits early on so that they don't end on the wrong side of aging. So for now, I think this is what I have to speak and rest as we delve in the conversation. Very good. Thank you, Raj. Um, George, if I can ask you to answer the same question as it relates to, you know, the rest of the Asia pack and then in particular in Australia where you are. So, I mean, aging's had a, a strong focus here in Australia over the last couple of years. In 2018, the federal government announced the Royal Commission into the age, aging population. And for those who are not in a Commonwealth country, a Royal Commission is sort of the highest level review you can get in, in Australia or in any Commonwealth countries. And, and that review spread over across the COVID period. So we had a almost forensic examination of the issues around aging in Australia. And a lot of issues came up. Um, some of which technology can play a major role. So in the short term, one of the biggest issues that was, we faced was that lack of integration between aged care services, aging services and healthcare services. And that lack of integration led to a lot of uh, issues around uh, people being transferred from one facility to another and their records not being made available. So 
managing that's become a huge issue. We've had some some very interesting initiatives locally where uh, they're leveraging our national shared electronic health record as a transfer of care summary document between various parts of the healthcare sector for the older uh, for elder population who have specific needs. We've also had a significant investment by the government into implementing high quality telemedicine solutions into residential aged care facilities to enable remote care to be delivered. Um, keeping in mind that Australia has a population of 25 million in a land mass greater than the continental United States, we have those challenges of, of, of distance. In the medium term, we've started to look how aged care, primary care, healthy aging can integrate more effectively so that we have care models that take into account the differences and I think the the presentations this morning really highlighted those different stages of aging and how we need to uh, adapt to them so enable models that are both preventative but also identify that once people have an issue they need some support to re-enable them to get back to their their status quo and in the long term we've had a strong growth in the longevity medicine industry so keeping in mind that David Sinclair the guru at Harvard is actually a, an Australian graduate We've seen a large level of interest in new practices delivering models of care that extend longevity. And um, at the moment, that's predominantly a private pay model. So we're, as we've seen in Silicon Valley, the, those with a lot of money are throwing, throwing a lot of money at improving their longevity. But there's a recognition that by doing that effectively, we reduce the demand on our services as we go forward. So you know, the big problem we have there is that Healthcare services here being predominantly public funded are very much very tightly linked to election cycles. So things that have decades return on investment are hard to get the right government funding for, but we are starting to see an uptick in, in that. A lot of that's driven by the fact that about 30 years ago in Australia, we introduced uh, what we call superannuation. So this is basically people saving for their for their own retirement. So there's a the bulk of people now going into retirement in Australia are sitting on a significant nest egg of their own money that they uh, now have access to after 30 years. So you, you actually can't access it before you hit 63 years old in Australia. Now that with people having access to that funding, there's a pool of money that they're being used in a uh, in, in new ways to uh, support aging processes and people in going through healthy aging uh, life cycles. Very good, thank you, George. Um, I, I think all of you have mentioned, and of course in this conference, we started off with data and digital. Um, I'd like just to dig into that whole area of digital health and virtual care uh, as a specific need for innovation. Um, and what I'm interested in from all of you is, you know, what, what are the greatest digital health innovation needs as you see them in your region? Um, and if you could give some specific examples, so much the better. Uh, and perhaps Raj, we can start with you this time. Thanks, John, and thanks, George, for your uh, insightful talk. So, you know, as, as you look at India, as I said, we have, uh, we sit on multiple challenges which leave us with no other chances but to innovate. You know, on one side, we have the income gap, then we have the distance gap, and then we have the aging gap. And, you know, the with families going uh, nuclear, then joint families, that's a big uh, societal change that we are undergoing for the last couple of decades. The family culture values are kind of eroding, so people are on their own. There is issue of loneliness. So I see a huge opportunity of virtual communities, you know, to keep those seniors engaged to keep those seniors connected we already have i think a good number of providers in the private space uh, who are into home care who are into assisted living and i think this is one uh, segment that's growing pretty fast given that we have around 140 million senior citizens and which are going to grow at three percent every year which is huge We're going to grow at almost three billion three and a half million every year which is not less and i think iot is one thing that i see as something which is going to be uh, more, uh, I think, fundamental to every senior citizen, kind of devices that you would carry yourself if you're alone. Uh, mental health issues are going to be a serious cause of concern, which means psychometric tools you require, plus technology-assisted tools that you can uh, you help them to address the issue of loneliness. And I see those innovations. As I said, the tight program of the government for which the calls are already open, the technology interventions, the government is doing its bit in funding those things. I fund one of the funding committees of the grand challenges of the government. 
and there's a lot of money flowing in government is aware of the fact that you know technological innovations can deliver the need gap that we have we also have shortage of doctors gerontologists i think as a field you cannot create doctors overnight you know it's it's a long haul uh, so i think uh, technology will be a big enabler for us to address the huge gap right from your iot for assisted living to uh, virtual communities i also see a big role probably where uh, for at least some segment of the population mixed reality would be big you know the uh, the metaverse though it still appears to be theoretical but i see a huge uh, opportunity for that engaging with senior citizens i'm not still talking about the medical size of it because that is as good as people hitting 40s they have their own set of problems but uh, recently we did a study on uh, hearing and speech problem it was a study done with 59000 people across a few states at health parliament we put the report on the website so i think this the uh, the speech and hearing issue is also growing which means that you address one issue the second surfaces up so is going to be a continuous innovation challenge addressing issues of mobility uh, mobility is one side loneliness is other mental health is other the physical health is another so i think uh, innovations driven by technology are going to be fundamental to address at least some part of it you cannot replace the human part the family support but some part of it like you know today we are talking from different parts of the world you are in new york george is in australia i am in delhi i mean same is happening with families you know most of the families in india have family members spread across continents i think technology can play an important role in at least bridging that mental divide if not the physical one so i think technology will be inseparable from the process of aging and will play a key role as the time progresses you know to get integrated into the daily routines very good thank you raj uh, george let's stay with you online uh, again sure. same question uh, around innovation in digital health in particular well, yeah, in Australia, we don't have a technology issue. I mean, we have a national broadband network. We have almost 100% adoption of electronic medical records. We've got, uh, you know, one of the highest per capita uses of technology in the world. Our biggest challenge is in, a, is in workforce and in particular around digitally skilled workforces and not just at the coalface delivering care, but in the back, back office managing the data. So what we find in Australia is that, you know, data analysts, AI specialists, informaticians, call them what you like, but they need to be entrenched deeply into the operational side of the organization to provide the carers at the coalface with the tools to provide the care they can they can, they can use to scale the, the, the care required because you know, with a limited workforce, uh, that, that workforce needs to be able to be a lot more efficient in delivering care. They need to use that data to not only measure what they're doing, but use it as part of the continual improvement. And one of the challenges we've always faced with data in Australia is that you know, up till now, we've been capturing data for compliance and for billing purposes. But now there's a recognition that that, that that data is a rich tool for us to basically improve our quality, safety and efficiency of our care. So trained workforce, people who are passionate about using technology as an innovative tool to improve their service, not just, you know, Part of their normal workforce, but you know, and and uh, I don't know, an old colleague of mine, Eric Dishman, used to used to say that our biggest challenge isn't in in our technology; it's in our imagination about how we can use that technology to deliver more effective care. And that's requires a workforce who not only understands the care, but also needs to understand the technology and can bring that together. So, I mean, initiatives like Raj's uh, digital uh, training in, in initiatives in India are great examples of getting people to uh, be be in both camps, not just be a technologist, not just be a carer, be a techno technologically enabled carer. Very good. And I, I think it's a nice uh, bridge comment to IQVIA as an organization. So uh, Andrew, how do you think about digital health and virtual care? Absolutely. So we will stick with our focus on Africa today to look at the rise of digital health technologies throughout the continent. Um, we've really seen a significant amount of uptake in e-learning platforms and e-learning tools by providers in a number of countries who are wanting to gain additional skills for helping with you know, specific populations. So we've seen growth there. Um, we've also seen, of course, um, continued growth in mobile health technologies with now over 75% of Africa's population having some mobile access. 
Of course, it varies from country to country. Um, and then finally, uses of, of telehealth. Um, but one of the most exciting things that I think we're seeing um, in a number of studies that we've done is the growth of what's known as digital clinics. Um, there's a, a really interesting series of digital clinics in Ghana um, that have had s substantial amount of success in the last five years in using some computer-assisted diagnostic tools um, recently to be able to um, uh, diagnose and interpret TB um, remotely and then provide information through outputs to the providers and to the patients, um, uh, direct, indirect printouts to them. Um, these digital clinics have grown. We've seen them in Kenya, in Ghana, and of course in South Africa. Um, but one of the, the sort of larger overarching concerns that we see on the African continent is once you get some of these pilot projects or um, new sorts of digital clinics up and running, how do you sustain the ones that you have? And then how do you actually grow them? Um, so one of the, the struggles that we found in the case of Uganda, that it had significant success with um, um, some virtual ultrasounding um, technologies that they had developed, is that you know, once, once you had a few up and going through digital clinics, the government support that was there in the beginning wasn't able to sustain it. And so the Ugandan government actually issued a recent moratorium to stop digital health pilots. Um, so this is something that we're seeing in a number of places where um, you kind of have that first you know, instance that, that does really well, but then you can't sustain it beyond that. Um, but one of the things that we're also looking at is how can you use digital health tools to not only train the providers, but to train some patients themselves um, if they have mobile access to be able to you know, kind of search, search their electronic health records and, and request opportunities to learn how to, you know, you know, do some basic things that they can do at home um, that are helpful for healthy aging. So um, those are some of the key initiatives that we're looking at, but I would say that's long-term sustainability and government support for digital health pilots is one of the greatest challenges that we face throughout Africa. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. And I'd like to stay with you, Andrew, because I think one of the things we promised our audience online and in the room is it would be as practical as possible. And you gave a good example of specific countries in Africa doing things. Can you give us an example of one country, perhaps, or one place in which you've been impressed uh, with the initiative that's been taken and tell us more about that, uh, perhaps in a case study fashion, um, particularly in terms of the deployment of that technology and getting traction with it? Yeah. One of the things that I think um, Tanzania has done really well is trying to increase remote access to clinical trials for um, you know, giving patients the chance to have access to medications that they might not otherwise receive based on their geography. So we all know that access, affordable access to medications throughout a number of countries in Africa continues to be a challenge and we work as IQVIA with a number of partners and NGOs and governments to, to increase that. But one of the ways that you can increase access is um, providing clinical trial affordability and cl clinical trial access. And one of the things that the Tanzanian government did was actually eliminate some of the barriers to getting patients to participate and also getting providers to participate in clinical trials. Because, you know, we think about the, the transportation and the challenges that patients themselves face with, you know, deciding to sign up. But, but often the first challenge is how do you get a provider that's actually interested and is willing to jump through the hoops that they need to jump through um, to be an investigator on a trial? And so this was a partnership through the government in Tanzania um, with, um, you know, the Gates Foundation and with us at IQVIA to make sure that we could kind of facilitate trials a little bit more readily. Yeah, and I think there we can see a very good example of best practice, uh, in this case in Africa, that we could adopt in places like the United States, where absolutely. clinical trials are still very often done with spreadsheets and emails. So It, it absolutely is, and we're, we're talking here in the United States about you know, struggles for access to patient recruitment and enrollment as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Raj, same question back to you. Can you describe a particular case study um, in health tech deployment, digital health deployment, uh, within an Indian context that has been impressive to you and tell us more about it, please. Yeah, so John, one of the biggest uh, things that government did, and this also, I think, is a proof of the technology prowess of Indians and India by and large, is during COVID, you know, we digitized the entire rollout of the vaccine initiative. So as we speak, we have delivered 2.2 billion vaccines through technology. 
none of us carry paper records i mean even when i travel to us i have a government you know uh, given platform which i use the i mean there are number of initiatives so digi locker uh, initiative of the government has bought all the government documents in one place rather than you know having senior citizens to search here and there for what they have to carry the the health and wellness centers which are 150000 in the country all have telemedicine so people don't have to you know look at traveling to a far off remote location to talk to a specialist the e sanjeevni program has delivered 120 million e consultations now this is backed by ai so you know india is like a country with 36 states in union territory which means that you know you have around every state has a regional language probably more total of 1500 dialects or more probably so what has happened in this new technology is that i can be in karnataka talking in kannada and talking to a doctor at up in hindi when he responds back i will hear in my language and he will hear in his language so i think on the technology side we have made life much easier we have got the government uh, rolled out pharmacies which give at very subsidized rate Uh, so i think we have quite a few initiatives on each one of them are at scale so there are no pilot or pilotitis because all of them cross tens of million so you know i am amazed at the kind of uh, swiftness with which we have rolled out technology i mean today a person actually doesn't need to go to a hospital i mean you can just log on the e sanjeevni platform of the government and get a free consultation on your mobile phone so i think it's a very exciting time for india a uh, few years back i used to feel very embarrassed that i represent a company a country where you know our technology is rule the world but we don't have the benefits flowing back at home and today i mean with great pride i say that we are probably delivering uh, technology at scale and scope which none country in the world can think of i think uh, so i think seniors and at older adults will benefit immensely from this technology rollouts very good thank you raj uh, and just to attest to what raj is saying uh I was in India a year ago. I think George and Brian and Ish Alliance were there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think some of the digital health landscape in India is uh, completely different to the way I perceived it from a decade ago, for example. Um, it's it's an incredible turnaround. Uh, George, same question for you. Uh, you know, in in your context, uh, what's something that's impressed you as a particular initiative, particularly around health tech deployment? Cool. Well, I mean, I, actually, I'll just reflect on Andrew's comment around pilots. I mean, you know, in Australia, we have a saying that there's digital health has more pilots than Qantas, who's our national airline. So we've had so many, so many pilots go into play, and the challenge has always been their sustainability, their scalability, and their ability to uh, interoperate. So probably the most exciting initiative, and it's only a fairly new initiative here, is the uh, the the what well, we focus on the use of fire. So fast healthcare interoperability resources as a interoperability tool. So the government's actually now essentially mandated that all health tools need to be able to use fire standards to interoperate. Uh, and as a result, we've got shown a growth in interoperability and a ability to use best of breed systems more effectively. In particular, that's related to their use in aged care because part of the new government mandate is around a standards based clinical information system in aged care that can interoperate so even though fire is originally an australian developed standard and has been taken up around the world you know 10 years after it was first designed here by graham greve it's now become the de facto standard in australia so that focus on standards focus on standardization of of data tools and data models and the implementation of interoperable systems across the country i think has sort of been a uh, a trigger for us to really you know kick up our use of technology in in health and aged care yeah very good thank you thank you george um I, we, you know the theme of this whole conference has been to be not only practical but also uh, to think about what needs to change in policy terms so i'd like to ask this of of all of you uh, perhaps as a last question um So if you were to recommend one major change uh in policy or approach uh that would have the greatest potential to impact uh the scope for healthy aging generally um and and please if you've got to don't don't feel shy I'm not trying to necessarily constrain you but but what would that be and why um and and in this case George let's start with you sure so look I think one of the big things that we really like to see more effectively used in 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 Australia and globally really is improved health and digital literacy so you know a population who can 
be more involved in their own self-care because they understand the the situation. So we saw during COVID, you know, misinformation being used to drive bad behaviors or, or negative behaviors. Um, but when we saw also in a, a large part of the population who became more health literate, you know, we had a lot of time to be sitting in front of the screens. We, we Australia had some of the, the longest lockdowns in the world. So you know, we saw a significant increase in the health literacy of our population. And as a result, we've seen changes in their behavior that have led to better outcomes. So you know, provide the tools for increase, increasing health literacy, in, provide digital literacy tools so people can access that information in real time in conjunction with their healthcare providers. I mean, we've gone away from this paternalistic model that the doctor owns his record and the patient has no right to it. We have concept now of a shared electronic health record where everybody's working off the same page, using those tools so that we can manage the escalation of care as required and communication. So health literacy, digital literacy, and tools to enable that to be uh, shared across the entire population, not just the healthcare providers. Excellent. Thank you, George. Uh, Raj, let's stay with you on online. Uh, the, the, your whole thoughts in terms of the policy realm and what needs to change to bring about greater healthy aging. So I think, John, uh, SDGs have made our life very, very easy. The way they are designed, so the first one of zero poverty, zero hunger, and the third one is health and well-being. So I think if you really look at caring for seniors or older adults, we need to address the SDG one and two, third will follow. So if you just try to attack the third one, it's not going to work. So we need to make sure that there is an financial stability. Uh, there is an economic guarantee to them so that they have a social security in place to take care of their health. So I would go with SDG one and two to make sure SDG three happens. So that is what my recommendation would be. Uh, nicely connected to some of the UN directives, Raj. Thank you very much. I've deliberately come to the uh, the policy man at IQ via last <laughs> on this, so Andrew might have more to say here. But what policy changes would sure, you recommend? Sure. Th thanks, John. And I, and I think you know I've spoken a lot about our focus in Africa today, but I think this recommendation is one that is truly transferable globally, and that is I, I think policy support surrounding the development of a true ecosystem of both recruitment and training of long-term care workers is significant. Here in the United States, in Africa, and in a number of the other markets where IQVIA has a presence around the world, um, we're, we're hitting a, a point of significant tension around recruitment of long-term care workers um, globally. And I think leveraging digital training and digital tools um, to develop um, a training platform and a recruitment is going to be significant for us in the next five to 10 years. And I think if we don't have governments that are thinking ahead about what sort of, and, and this is resource driven, you know, financially, um, but also eliminating of barriers to finding, seeking out and, you know, really retaining a workforce of people um, who support long-term care, um, we're, we're gonna see significant problems down the road. So I think that's number one for us right now. Very good. Um, just as I can, just as a slight follow up on the same question, and Andrew, I'll start with you. I noticed nobody said explicitly, at least, greater investments uh, in healthy aging at the policy level, um, uh, whether that's at federal level or state level or province level or whatever it might be. Do you agree that needs to take place? And perhaps as a follow on to that, uh, philosophically, we also talked about people being captain of their own health ship. Uh, so the consumer side of all of this as well. Uh, how do you think about that in, 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 in the sense of policy? Sure. I mean, investments, of course, are important. But a lot of times what we have happen, and I think about this here in the United States, is you have resources at maybe the state and municipal levels, as well as the federal level, um, you know, for digital training, digital technologies, new pilots. But, but it's, it's really about kind of putting the resources in the right place, in the right hands, and connecting dots. I mean, we saw this a lot during COVID-19 in the public health surveillance realm, where the data was out there, but getting the data to the right people and interpreted in the right way was the challenge. And that wasn't always a resource thing. Um, so that would be my answer. Uh, George. Yeah, so, so one thing I've discovered in my 40 year career is that you know, we're always asking for more investment. Unfortunately, getting it's a lot more harder, complicated than what we would like it to be. We are, we are in an interesting situation in Australia. Like I pointed out earlier, 
the 30 years ago when the government introduced compulsory superannuation has now meant that those people going into retirement age are sitting on significant nest eggs. So you know, the requirement for government investment is being offset by the fact that uh, people going into retirement are now sitting on significant nest eggs of, of cash. And as pointed out earlier, you know, the real estate boom over the years has also left them with significant assets. So self-investment, people getting spending, you know, investing in their own healthy aging is becoming a stronger focus here. And, uh, you know, our challenge is we have a small population, so there's only there's only about five million people in that in that in that phase. So uh, when I was in Mumbai, where they had 25 million people literally living around the hotel that I was staying at, so you know, we have that challenge of a of a small population. But you know, self investment people rather than just rely on government investment because you know, unfortunately we're we're seeing a bit of a drying up of that model. People are investing themselves and we have that mechanism now in Australia. So that should be an exciting um, adventure going forward. Very good. Okay. Raj, let's give you the last word. See, um, as a policymaker, age has already increased without investments. You know, the longevity has gone up. So I'm not sure if we need a better mindset and a better system or more money. But clearly, I think uh, the longevity proves whether we invest or not, longevity is going up across the world. So what we need is a mix of uh, public health measures and social vaccines than actual vaccines. Uh, a lot more on the other side of ecosystem needs to shape. I mean, uh, well, I think trainings are more important. Self-care is equally important. Technology is supporting all three. I'm not sure if I have the ready answer to saying more money will lead to better health. But uh, I think a better utilization of existing system, uh, better science around research of what works and what doesn't work, because some parts of the world we have longevity as good as 100. Uh, I think we need to invest more in the research part first, rather than the programs first. Very good. Well, as usual, uh, we've only scratched the surface. I think you can see the richness of thinking in individual countries like Australia and other places. I know George has worked in India and then uh, Andrew's comments as they've related to Africa, are of course, only part of IQVIA's work. Um, again, I think sharing best practices is an important part of this. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, all three people on this panel are uh, uh, very key members of the ECH Alliance, and we'd like to keep the conversation going uh, uh, afterwards on an ongoing basis with our audience online and in the room. Um, but that's the end of this uh, this session and the morning session. Of those of you in the room, uh, it will be lunchtime. Those of you online, uh, I think you have an hour before we start after lunch. Uh, but I'd like you to show your appreciation to the people on the panel. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you.